Hello friends, my name is Tyler Brownrigg and welcome to another episode of Hitting the Field Main Show. We apologize for the delay, we had some technical difficulties, but we are still here. And it's going to be a great show for you today. Two new sports debuting here on Main Show. We're going to be talking about figure skating and the historic performance by Ilya M Manlin. And follow that will be NBA. Eight. Andrew gave us his All-NBA teams, his All-NBA rookie teams, and his All-NBA defensive teams. And then finally, the rant, WrestleMania. Cody Rhodes, finish the story, and I'll be telling you that story. So stick around. You won't want to miss any of this because Main Show starts right now. Things gonna change when I really hit the field. Undefeated chance, man, you know what's the deal. Trying to find a kid, I'm in a field doing drills. Boy, you just a sucker, you ain't never kidding. So stick around. Teams is all. Hello friends, my name is Tyler Brownrigg and welcome to another episode of Hitting the Field Main Show. We apologize for the delay, we had some technical difficulties, but we are still here. And it's going to be a great show for you today. Two new sports debuting here on Main Show. We're going to be talking about figure skating and the historic performance by Ilya M Manlin. And follow that will be NBA. Eight. Andrew gave us his All-NBA teams, his All-NBA rookie teams, and his All-NBA defensive teams. And then finally, the rant. WrestleMania. Cody Rhodes, finish the story, and I'll be telling you that story. So stick around. You won't want to miss any of this because Main Show starts right now. Things gonna change when I really hit the field. Undefeated chance, man, you know what's the deal. Trying to find a kid, I'm in a field doing drills. Boy, you just a sucker, you ain't never keep it real. Three rings in my hand, I'm a warrior to the max. When I hang it up, they gon' have to give me plaques. Step up in the building and I only bring the facts. When I make a highlight, they gon' replay, run it back. Okay, always locked in, I don't got time to lack. Saying he the best, he could take a lap. Bad at 1,000 when you check the stats. Boy, is you ready? You ain't got to ask. And we are back. And joining me for the segment to talk figure skating, Maddie Glass making her final appearance on Main Show as she will be graduating this semester. It is so sad to see you go. Yep. <laughs> but you'll, you'll still be here for draft shows, so don't worry. I will. And uh, joining me making her nighttime debut. Night. Or not night, night. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm thinking about you. Uh, her Main Show debut, Anya Gary Bashvili. A uh, bit of dichotomy here with you two, but how are you feeling being on Main Show for the first time? I am feeling so incredibly excited. I am getting to talk about a sport I really love, and that is figure skating. So, so. yes, let's jump right into it. Ilya Malinin, yeah. I got it this time, uh, had a historic performance in, at the World Championships. Uh, her, his figure skating, day, it was truly amazing. So, Anya, I, I want to start with you. We're going to get... Her, his full performance up in just a moment. But tell us about, just give us an intro, who Ilya is and what we're about to see. Yes. So Ilya Malinin is a 19-year-old currently from Virginia. He is nicknamed the quad god in U.S. figure skating because he is the first person to land a quadruple axle that has four and a half rotations in the air during competition. This is a feat that a lot of figure skaters in the competitive world said would most likely not happen. So we are going to get to watch his performance. He completes four, or not, excuse me, not four, six quadruple jumps. And shall we take a look at it now, guys? Uh, I agree. Let's, let's, yeah, let's get the, uh, let's get, let's get the full performance up. Uh, it should be up in just a moment. So uh, we're, me, uh, to give you a bit of a breakdown of this, uh, Anya is going to be our real play-by-play -play expert here, breaking it down. And me and Maddie are just going to, I know Maddie has a bunch of like fun facts you want to yeah, share about Ilya. Well, so he is skating to the movie from HBO Succession. Great TV show. You should uh, yeah, so this is sadly why we can't play this with audio due to copyright restrictions. Even NBC Sports got copyright striked. Uh, truly insane. So here is the start of his performance. Uh, so Anya, be sure, let us know when you see the first quadruple yes, axle. Yes, here and he is. He's doing some step footwork right here to set up for the jump. Here he is. He's about to set up. One last turn. Here he goes. And there is the historic quadruple axle. And what, why is that move so impressive, so historic? That it is so historic it? because it is borderline defying the laws of physics. A lot of figure skaters, a lot of physicists say that it should not be possible. And yet here he is, 19-year-old Ilya Malinin, competing with it. 
I read that like it's like Usain Bolt like breaking one of the, his running world records. Like it's the same type of level yes. of just impossible feat that like yes. nobody thought would happen. And he's the first and only person to ever complete this jump. Yes, that is true. Um, quad jumps have become a staple in men's figure skating. Here he goes doing a quad loop. Wonderful. Uh, Nathan Chen, another U.S. figure skater, he's known for his quads, but he cannot do the quad axle. So considering this new up-and-coming figure skater is able to do so is amazing. Here he goes. He's setting up for a quad let's, I believe. No, never mind. And, and speaking of quads, Maddie, I believe you had a, you told me about a nickname that he had, yes, actually. Yes, he is known as the oh. quad god for obvious reasons. Uh, just a quad axle. How much is that worth, like, in points? Like, how much does it add to the total? So the baseline for the quad axle is 12 and a half points, one of the highest scoring ones. And additionally, if you have advanced movements, for example, you have your hands up in the air, it counts to more towards points. I believe he scored around 14 points for that quad axle. And again, the big thing is he hit six of these quadruple axles. And this is something uh, of... Not axles, jumps. Or jumps, yes, yes excuse me. Uh, what, can you explain the difference between the two? Yeah, yeah. So axle is a type of jump. Uh, it actually has an extra half rotation because you enter going forwards and land backwards. All the other jumps are just full rotations in the air. And it just depends on what foot and what edge you are taking off and landing on. Now, now see him here, celebrate or not celebrating quite yet, but he's really getting into his routine, I can tell you. Yes, a lot of reporters, when they discuss Malinin, they're talking about how he's finding his personality through these footwork combinations on the ice. His short program featured a lot of them. Um, he was in a matador costume for that, and it is incredible to see him just blossom into the figure skater he's becoming. And he first landed this for the first time when he was 17, yes. I believe, at the Grand Prix, Prix uh, Grand Prix. Yeah, Grand uh, Prix. Oh, another skating one. Final. Yes. So that was the four. That was the quad lutz Euler triple sow cow jump. He did a total of seven and a half rotations right there. Yeah, it's just insane. It it feels like it should not be possible what he's doing. No, not at all. People are asking him about the quintuple lutz and quintuple jumps, and he's saying that it honestly might be possible, even though. Basically, physics says it shouldn't be. And I think this performance is also so impressive because he said before that he was struggling of whether to even compete. He uh, said he was struggling to overcome mental and physical challenges. And he's only 19 years old. Yes, he was also struggling with a left foot injury previously to this that cast out on a short program. But seems like he has bounced back. I believe we're winding down near to the end yes. of his performance. Uh, I believe there's less than a minute yes. now going, going to highlight. Uh, uh, this move right here, this where he's spinning, uh, can you tell, me, tell us what that is? So that way he right there is a camel to back sit flying sit. And it is just another type of element that is required for programs. Um, I believe you're required to have a certain amount of jumps and a certain amount of spins for long programs. And he's just competing, completing those requirements right there. And that right there was actually his signature move, the raspberry twist. Um, mainly named because of his last name, meaning raspberry in Russian. Yeah, th this is the move. I don't think uh, I'll ever be able to comprehend how it's done, how they're, how he's just spinning in place. But seemingly, it's not like he's even like moving in his hips or anything. Mm -hmm. How did but, they like not get dizzy? Um, and, you spin too fast. And that was just the end of his performance. <laughs> yes. uh, c again, a huge congratulations to Ilya, an absolutely historic mm -hmm. performance. But sadly, that is all the time we have to talk figure skating. Uh, it was great having both of you on. Thank you. Uh, I had a great time talking about it. Learned a lot, but. Uh, stick around after this because we will be talking NBA and Andrew's teams and selections and they're pretty bad. <laughs> uh, spoilers. So stick around. Hello, my name is Tyler Brownrigg. I hope you're enjoying watching whatever show it is that's playing right now here on Hitting the Field Network. And if you're interested in more of our shows or want to know more about the one you're currently watching, don't worry, I'm here to tell you. Our week starts off on Mondays with HTF Bets, hosted by the Bets Boys, Andrew Montana, Ezra Hines and Giovanni St. Surin. You can catch that show live Mondays at noon for all things betting in sport. I highly recommend it. And then you can follow it off on Tuesday with The Combine, hosted by the illustrious Ty Patton. If you're in for a more laid back, kind of podcast style show, a lot more casual, that is definitely the show for you. Maybe you'll catch some Ty Squared action with me on there. Wednesdays every week, you'll be able to catch the vlog learn about what's going on behind the scenes here in the studio at Hitting the Field. Get to know more about us, especially the people behind the camera, who they are and what we do to make these shows every week. And on Thursdays, live at noon, you can watch the main show with me as your host every Thursday, 
where we'll be covering all of the major storylines for any sport, be it football, basketball, hockey, soccer, you name it, we'll be talking about it on the main show. And then Friday, you can watch Nighttime with your hosts, Matty Glass and Patrick Previty for all things college sports, especially with a focus on UCF sports and maybe the ones you haven't heard about so often, like tennis or women's track and field. It can be anything college on nighttime. And if you're interested in joining Hitting the Field and you're a UCF student, DM us on any of our social medias at Hitting the Field, and also give us a follow on all those and subscribe to this channel if you want to catch more of our content. But enjoy the rest of your show. As always, I'm Tyler Brownrigg, and I'll be seeing you on Main Show. And we are back. Joining me here for this NBA segment is Jared Fox and Jeremy Beland. So let's just get, jump right into this because we have a lot to cover. So uh, our producer, Andrew Montana, he made his predictions for the All-NBA, All-Defense, and All-Rookie teams that will be announced uh, dur later in, after the, during the playoffs. So I'll jump right into it, starting with his All-Rookie team. So we'll start with All-Rookie first team. His All-Rookie first team, he has... Victor Wembanyama in first uh, winning also winning rookie of the year because he's the top pick. Chet Holmgren, Jaime Hawkins Jr., er, Pods and Brandon Miller for the Charlotte Hornets. That rounds out the first team. And in the all rookie second team we have Asar Thompson, Derek Lively, Keontae George, Scoot Henderson, and uh, Carson. His last name is escaping me for some reason right now. Case, Case, Car Carson Wallace. Excuse me, not. Ca Case and Wallace. Case of Wallace. Yeah, Case yeah. of Wallace, excuse me. So, uh, uh, Jared, I'll start with you. Any just quick reactions that you have, initial thoughts of seeing this? I thought it was a pretty good list, to be honest with you. Like, I mean, you're picking 10 rookies. The one I would say that I think deserves a little bit of love is Gigi Jackson. But I, at the end of the day, I mean, it's really just a pick em. I I'm not saying Gigi Jackson deserves to be on first team, but I think he could have snuck in to second team. Uh, and Jeremy, what are your initial reactions to Andrew's list? Honestly, looking at it, I feel like it's a pretty solid list. Like, when you look at it, there are a lot of big names here who um, obviously have, like, done a lot for their franchises. So I wouldn't say necessarily that I think anybody got snubbed entirely in this one. But, um, you know, there are some people who possibly could have made cases for, like, the last or, like, the ninth or tenth spot. Okay. Uh, I, I want to talk about a very notable snub because I there are two names I think I have issue with on his list, and that's Keontae George and Scoot Henderson. Yeah. Okay? Uh, one of those guys can be on there, but I think the exclusion of Bayal Kualabi, the French rookie for the Washington Wizards and former teammate of Victor Wembanyama, I, I think he deserves to be on the second team over either of them, honestly, George or Scoot. Because Scoot, at the beginning of this year, had such efficiency issues. Like, he was just shot-chucking. It just wasn't there. He was not really adjusting to the NBA at all. He, he's kind of come around. He's averaging, like, 13 points a game. He, he rounded the out. Season. He's rounded yeah. out, you know. Uh, Kuyabi, Bilal is only averaging 8-4-2, uh, and two, though he's shooting at great efficiency, 43% from the field, 35 from three. So, and I understand the Wizards suck. Right? Like, that, 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 that makes sense. But, you know, the Spurs suck, and we have Wemby as the Rookie of the Year. So I, I feel like he deserves some consideration. Those are two completely yeah. different players. Okay. Those are two completely I feel, I feel different like, though, players. With most NBA awards, it's like we, winning and how your team performance is taken into account. But I believe the exception is the rookie teams. Well, okay. The well, voters also, take that well you have account. to also count, account for the fact that Wemby was the first overall pick. So he's I a mean, generational player. And a, Seven yeah, foot and four, a generational player could win DPOY as well as a rookie. Probably so won't. I don't think he probably will. won't. But I honestly think he deserves it. But I think come on, every year after this, he will win it. Yeah. But speaking that. of Victor's defensive prowess, moving on now to Andrew's all defensive teams. First, in in the all defensive first team, we have we have SGA, Derek White, Anthony Davis, Rudy Gobert, and Victor Wembanyama rounding out the first team. And in the second team, we have Jalen Suggs, Alex Caruso, Jaron Jackson Jr., Herb Jones, and Kawhi Leonard. All right. Me looking at this, I there's some problem names. For sure. One in particular is Jaron Jackson Jr. I don't know why he's here, what he's done, <laughs> frankly, his fraudulent depoy uh, a, a year or two ago. Uh, Jared, do you have any initial reactions? Yeah, I don't think Jaron belongs on this list either. I think it's kind of just recency bias. And I think, personally, I mean, come on. I know we got one Orlando Magic on there, but there should be two. The Minister of Defense 
being snubbed on this list. Are you kidding me? Oh, J.I., Jonathan Isaac, oh, the well, guy. That's right. J.I., the guy. Well, you have a good one, too. So yeah. I'll let you so, cook. But so J.I., yeah, come yeah, on. Yeah, who is... So you were assigned to give us your snub for this, Jeremy. Who is, who is Andrew snubbing from the all-defensive team? So honestly... I would, my biggest or the biggest person I think should be off this list is Anthony Davis because um, actually if you look at NBA.com and you look at defensive ratings, uh, Nikola Jokic has a bigger uh, or a higher defensive rating than Anthony Davis. I believe he's averaging like 1.9 steals per game and like 0.9 blocks. So I think that's something to consider. I mean, he might not be the greatest defensive player like right now, but I believe that he should be on the list. I, I, I just want to get this out. Nikola Jokic, I think, is a crazy pick. Because, as you say, Jokic is not known for his defense. He, I mean, I, I watched him play against the Timberwolves last night. And, like, he's not, defense just isn't what he's known for. It's not what he does at all. But who won last night? I, well, obviously. <laughs> but isn't it Minnesota a defensive team, too? They, they are. Have... And Rudy Gobert, the defensive player of the year front runner, is on the first team, which of makes course. sense. Yeah. But where is Bam? Okay, can that's, you address the elephant in the room? Yeah. Where is Bam Adebayo? I get it. Giovanni's screaming back there. Uh, I, I like Jokic over Bam. Listen, Bam, here's, here's some notable stats for Bam. He's averaging under one block per game. He's at, at .9 exactly. And he's averaging a mm. steal per game. So that's a total stock of, t or actually, no, 1.1 steal. So technically... Two. So yeah, two. Two exact. <laughs> 2.2 .2 stocks exactly. But he, that doesn't matter, dude. He it averages, does matter. <laughs> no, dude, he averages more rebounds than Jaron Jackson. What does Herb Jones do, all right? That's and right. frankly, and frankly, dude, and I know, we saw this all the time about Bam. Yes, he is a versatile defender. He guards one to five, but he deserves to be here. I think so, too. Also, shout out Jaden McDaniels, dude. You know, actually, I will say, yeah. but I, like talking a little bit about back to Jokic, he is a passing lane merchant. You see how many steals he gets in the passing lanes? I just want to throw that out there. So he's not a, not, a, not a real defender. All right, but let's <laughs> move it on. Not a real to, defender. Stop the cast. <laughs> so moving on to uh, what we all care about most, all NBA. So a, a reminder, all these lists are positionless now, just so you know, with the new rules update that the NBA had this season. Uh, so starting with all NBA first team. We have Luka Doncic, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Giannis Antetokounmpo, oh, and Nikola Jokic, and uh, and KD, quick n or KD, yes, yeah, KD and KD. And a quick note: uh, the red stats that you are seeing on the graphics that means that they are currently leading the league in that category. So Luka points per game and turnovers, and uh, Shea with steals. Now moving on to the All NBA second team: Jalen Brunson, Jason Tatum, which I think is a bit shocking but I'll get into that. LeBron James, Kawhi Leonard, and Anthony Davis. And then finally, rounding out with the All-NBA third team, Tyrese Halliburton, Steph Curry, Devin Booker, Devonta Sabonis, and rookie sensation Victor Wembanyama. There's a very big glaring issue, which Jared will get to talk about, but I want to say one, one initial reaction I have, why is Kevin Durant in first team over Jason Tatum? <laughs> Jason Tatum is the best player on the best team in the league, period. They're the only 60-win team in the NBA, and he has been amazing. Yes, maybe Durant has more points. Stop whistling in my ear. I hear you, Andrew. You're just a biased Lakers fan who just can't stand it. I get it. I understand. But it's, this is ridiculous. But, Jared, can we, can we address the biggest snub of this list, please? I mean, the biggest snub is so painfully obvious that, like, if you don't know who it is, you don't know ball. And that's because it's Anthony Edwards, baby. He belongs on this list, maybe third team. I would argue second team, to be honest. He averages more points per game than LeBron, Anthony Davis, Kawhi, and Sabonis. He has more 30-point games this season than Jokic, Stephen Curry, Kevin Durant, and Jason Tatum. And he's one of 11 players this year, including Malachi Flynn, to have a 50-point game this season which he just had on I believe it was Monday it was the other day against yeah, the, the Wizards right. it was against the Wizards so and he's the he's, he's the best player Two ago. he's the best player on the second best team in the west which before last night they were the number 1 team in the west so how are you leaving off any Timberwolves on this list like obviously it has to be Ant if you're putting a Timberwolf on there but like how are you leaving off Anthony Edwards like it's it's blasphemy so I oh, actually. 
you want to say something? Uh, no, I'll let you go first. I'll let you go first. So, I, I have a lot to say. Don't worry. So I'm just curious <laughs> about something. So you said, who would you put Anthony Edwards over in, in the second tier list? On the second tier? Well, I think Tatum should be one. Uh-huh. Um, on the second tier, remind me what it is. It, I believe I, I think Tatum should Bronson. be one, and then you could switch LeBron. I I'm think putting I'm putting said. him over Bron, bro. I'm See, putting him over Bron. I personally feel like Anthony Edwards is kind of elevated by the rest of his team because they do most of like the defensive work, while um he does most he of the offense. He is the offense. Yeah, I say he is like, the he offense. He is the no offense. But I say like the, I feel like especially, he's elevated by the team. Especially now that Cat was out, got injured in March. That's right. He has had to. Carry, carry the team. The load. Yes. Shout out Nas Reed, though. I love him. <laughs> Nas Reed I don't have a towel, yes. but listen. I, <laughs> I would towel. take Anthony Edwards over probably Devin Booker yeah, and for also sure. LeBron. Okay? So Devin LeBron. Booker, Devin Booker, seven assists Oops. per game, 27 points. That's more than Ant. Ant has more rebounds. Ant has more steals. And also, Ant is on the second best team in the West. And oh, by the way, they have a winning record against the Suns this season. All right? He is so much better. He's so much better than Devin Booker. I can't even begin to stress it, dude. It's, it's true. Like, Can I just add it's one thing? so ridiculous. Yes, Jared. I just want, I mean, Jared. It's okay. I just want to add one thing. LeBron is almost 40 years old carrying his oh team. Oh my god. We need to stop no. the slander on his name. I don't care. We need to stop the slander on his name. I get it. Grow Thir up, dude. He is 39 years old carrying a team. No, he is. Look Does Anthony Davis not exist? Anthony Davis is basically a street clothes player. He doesn't. He no, barely no, plays. No, no, that's not true. That's not true, and I don't like that take he's because played he's so played. Many games he's played ninety six of his last one hundred games, which is an absurd stat. He doesn't show up. That's the point. Bro, he's been showing up this year though. Oh, yes, no. yes, he has. No, he not. He's oh, in. He's goodness. in the deep, all defensive team here. Yeah. He's in the all NBA second well, he team. Should, he Jokic should be there above him. No, oh, my God, what does Jokic do? He has a higher defensive rating. Oh my! No, my God, dude. No, <laughs> the defensive rating. Oh my God, no. I, when I want an interior impact defender, I want Anthony Davis, not Nikola Jokic. Jokic Ooh. is a big You want to talk about someone who doesn't care about basketball? When is Jokic, Jokic just, is just out there, Yo, dude. He's I will just say having this. a good time. I will say this. Anthony Edwards averages more steals per game than Jokic this year. That's and that's a fact though. you can check. You can fact check me. Oh and Wemby. He averages more than Wemby and Jokic and Kyrie Irving. Shout out Jared, dude. My glorious king. Yes, Fighting the sir. Good I mean, when fight. he's playing G League teams like the, the Wizards and the Pistons, it's not hard. What? <laughs> they all play the same people. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's the amount of games that they play. If they're playing them the four games times. Matter now. If they're playing them four times compared to two, obviously the four times is gonna look a lot better. <laughs> do you wanna know, know why the games matter? There are some notable players who are uh ineligible for any of these awards. Yeah. Uh Joel Embiid, Kyrie Irving, Donovan Mitchell. They did not hit the 65 game threshold. So playing games does matter. Yes. And they probably would have been in and, the list. And Anthony Davis, Anthony, Anthony Davis and Kyrie. is eligible. Anthony Davis so. is eligible. <laughs> he played 65 games yeah. at least. I guess. But sadly, that is all the time we have for this segment. But we want to know, do you think, did Andrew Cook, were his list good? Let us know in the comments below. Uh, personally, uh, we all think he did awful. But that is all the time we have for this segment. Next up will be the rant, and I'll be telling you about Cody Rhodes and how he finished the story. Jack, buddy. Why are you here? I don't really understand why I'm here. I got called a delusional fan. I, I just don't understand why I'm delusional if I think Kirk Cousins had the best mustache in the league. Well, Jack, buddy, uh, I don't want to be the one to tell you this, but I don't think anybody looks cool in handlebars. But they're back, man. They're back. They're not. They're not. Sometimes you just gotta face the hard truth. It's right there in front of you. Uh, all these people, they, they, they're they calling you delusional, but sometimes you gotta worry about, am I projecting? Is it me? And in this Let me case, tell you something, bud. It could never be me. Anything I say is factual and truth, and that's why the Vikings are going 16-1 this year. Organization, you have to look at your roster and say, I've had Kirk O'Duggins for six years. Maybe it's time to move on. There is no moving on from Kirk Thuggins and <laughs> Justin Jefferson. Do you think that maybe this all started just because of a little disappointment? Nothing has started. This is how I live, and I am not delusional. I'm... And we are back, and it is time for the rant. If you didn't know, this past weekend, the greatest event in the wrestling, wrestling world and the most exciting event in sports entertainment, as they call it, occurred with WrestleMania 40. 
and on night two of the event, Cody Rhodes defeated Roman Reigns and won the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. Cody Rhodes finally finished the story and ended Reigns' record championship reign, which ended at 1,316 days, which is the modern era record. But just what exactly is this story? Who is Cody Rhodes and what did he finally finish at WrestleMania? And how did he get here at, to this point? That's what I want to tell you about now. Now, Cody's journey begins way before this starting point in 2022. So, but that's where I want to start. So back in 2022, Cody left AEW, a rival wrestling promotion company to the WWE, a company he helped started to rejoin the WWE as a superstar and officially made his comeback debut at WrestleMania 38 to a standing ovation. He then went on to beat Seth Rollins in that match, putting him back on the WWE map. Later, Cody Rhodes had his first promo as an official WWE superstar in Raw. And what he said is that he promised to do what his father, WWE Hall of Famer, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, could never do. Win the WWE title and finish the story. After that moment, he became a beloved figure in the WWE universe and became one of its biggest stars. He was beloved by fans all across the WWE universe. He then later went on to gain the respect and support of fans in his ensuing feud with Seth Rollins, where he ended it by winning against him in a Hell in a Cell match where he played with a torn pec muscle. A torn pec. He wrestled with a torn pec. Do you know how insane that is? The pain he had to play through in order to do that, in order to accomplish that feat. He, gained, he became the face of WWE in that moment. He then later went on to win his first ever Royal Rumble event later that year and earned the right to take on Roman Reigns in the main event and for a shot at the title he had been chasing for so long at WrestleMania 39. Cody, however, though, would end up coming just short and lost to Reigns and was unable to finish the story. And over the course, and over the course of the next year, it felt like Cody's journey was becoming directionless and hopeless at all points. Rhodes, however, was still able to persevere despite these new obstacles that were coming in its way. Be it The Rock returning and making a heel turn and getting a main event at WrestleMania, despite Cody demanding a rematch from Roman Reigns and then Paul Heyman, his manager, famously denying that chance at a rematch. And then the only way that Cody could secure another shot at the title was to go through CM Punk and win the Royal Rumble again. And then what did he do? He became the first man in 30 years to win back-to-back -back Royal Rumbles, setting him on a course to WrestleMania 40 for a rematch against Roman Reigns in Philadelphia at Lincoln Financial Field. And at WrestleMania, he and Roman Reigns became the first men ever to main event both nights at the event. Night one was a tag team match. It was Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes, yeah, they're friends now, going up against Roman Reigns and The Rock, the bloodline. The Rock and Reigns won that match, meaning that Rhodes and Reigns title match next night would be bloodline rules, meaning it would be a no disqualifications match. Anything goes. So night two, so night two the rematch finally arrived. And after a match that felt like it would never end and had guest appearances from the likes of John Cena coming in, in to say, of Cody Rhodes, to The Rock coming in to ruin everything seemingly and stop the story from being finished one more time, and The Undertaker out of nowhere coming out of retirement to choke slam The Rock, Cody Rhodes hit Roman Reigns with a Trinity Crossroads, his signature move, and defeated Roman Reigns and finally finished the story to become the undisputed WWE Universal Champion. It is difficult to put into words just how much hardship and struggle Cody had to go through to finally get to this moment. Back from in 2013 when he got fired in WWE, then came back as Stardust and it was like the lowest point in his life. He had to refine his identity. He was the laughing stock of the wrestling world and needed to redefine himself. However, he did do it. He jumped over every hurdle, overcame every obstacle and finished the story.
Cody's journey is perfectly summed up in a quote he had back when he was still in AEW, finally making a name for himself one again, once again when he was back in form. And he said this, quote, I went from undesirable to goddamn undeniable. Shout out Cody Rhodes, the American Nightmare once again, and congratulations on your championship. But sadly, that is all the time we have for this week of Main Show. Catch us next week for the season finale. And as always, I'm your host, Tyler Brownrig, signing off. Things gon' change when I really hit the field. Undefeated chance, man, you know what's the deal. Tryna find a kid, I'm in a field doing drills. Boy, you just a sucker, you ain't never keep it real. The rings in my hand, I'm a warrior to the max. When I hang it up, they gon' have to give me plaques. Step up in the building and I only bring the facts. When I make a highlight, they gon' replay, run it back, okay? Always locked in.